A wild weekend of college baseball as the regional round is officially in the books. Five SEC teams advancing to the Super Regionals. Guys, today we are breaking it all down. Looking back on the weekend that was, the teams that are advancing, the teams that are now at home. I am Chris Phillips. He is Harrison Fant. We are the wind-up. And again, guys, we appreciate you all tuning in here to SEC Unfiltered. Before we get going, guys, Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications, check us out via podcast, wherever you get podcasts. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. And I also want to shout out our friends over at SeatGeek because we're brought to you by SeatGeek. And guys, if you're looking to buy tickets to the Super Regionals, look no further than our friends at SeatGeek. SeatGeek.com, promo code SECU. Get $20 off your first purchase because who... Couldn't use an extra 20 bucks in their pocket. Again, SeatGeek.com, promo code SECU to get $20 off your Super Regionals tickets today. Like I mentioned, join my good friend Harrison Fant. Harrison, what's going on, man? appreciate you taking the time. Excited to break all this down with you. Chris, great to be here. And we got just an unbelievable, maybe the best ever regional weekend that I can remember um, this, this weekend. It was just unbelievable. The game is growing Every game felt so close. We had so many walkoffs. We had a record walkoffs in day one of six, and then nine walkoffs total between Friday and Saturday. Unbelievable! You couldn't have asked for anything better this week in the regional baseball. And we got supers now, so I'm excited for that. And I know you are too. I don't think it's recency bias to say it was one of the best regional rounds we've ever seen. Like when you mentioned yeah. all the walkoffs, the drama. It was a great weekend. You know, we were boots on the ground. And the storylines. The, the storylines, too. You know, we were boots on the ground Saturday in Clemson watching Vanderbilt, who a quick two in queue. We'll get to that more in a second. But, uh, you know, we were there boots on the ground. But I, I tell you, Harrison, as much fun as it was being at the ballpark, you mentioned this off the air, and I, I would say this as well. It was a great weekend to just sit down and watch squeeze play. And shout out to our friends, Mike Rooney, Chris Burke. They are friends of the show. We've had them on before. They did a great job with squeeze play, but I mean, it was yeah, shout out to with Mike all the Chris. with all the action going on, and Chris Budden who was hosting that thing. But yeah, and, with and all, Mike Schick too, and Mike Schick, all of the action that was going on, it was a great weekend to sit there. And I mean, it was it was wild, you know, trying to keep up with all these different SEC regionals, and you got like five different games happening at once, five different highlights. It was an electric weekend for sure. So, yeah. uh, with that being said, Harrison, first thing before we get into all the games. I do want to mention this because you and I talked about this last week. Your thoughts on, you know, we mentioned the strength of the two seeds in this tournament. No two seeds advance. Your thoughts on the reality that no two seeds advance after it seemed like we and everybody else hyped them up of how good the two seeds were. Yeah, because we were right about something, about the strength of a non-one seed, but we weren't right about which two seed. We were wrong because it was the strength of the three seeds this year. You had... Kansas State, three seed, Florida, three seed, West Virginia, three seed, Oregon, three seed, UConn, three seed, all advanced to Super Regionals. It was unbelievable. It it was, I've never seen the three seeds being this strong and have such great performances in the NCAA tournament, the regionals, and we got that this year. It just shows, it goes to show how much the game is growing and how better every team is around the country. Just the level of talent has elevated and elevated and elevated throughout, and it feels like it's we're at its best baseball in college right now. So, Haverson, let's start first with the five teams that advanced, and then I want to get into the six that didn't because there are some that it's like, hey, we saw this coming. There are others. It was a massive surprise. More on that later. Again, let's dive into the ones that did advance, though, Harrison. We'll start with the good news first. Uh, and the Tennessee Volunteers, they navigate through beating Southern Miss, Indiana, Norse. Your thoughts on Tennessee over the weekend? I mean, you and I both picked the balls. I, I thought it was a very – ho-hum weekend for Tennessee. We expected them to make way through the Knoxville Regional and do so, you know, I'll say with ease, but do so successfully. You don't have to sweat a whole lot. I felt like Tennessee did that. Your thoughts on what the balls did over the weekend winning the Knoxville Regional? Yeah, Chris, and you got to be you got to be happy if you're a Tennessee fan and Tony Vitello, just how they, how they went about the Regional this weekend. And obviously, they didn't have the strongest Regional of any team. And I think that Goes to show that, you know, the number one overall seed should be kind of structured like that. But to sum up the Knoxville Regional as briefly as possible, taking care of business <laughs> every day, taking care of business. I mean, that was the theme mm -hmm. in Knoxville. That's been the theme for them all season, Chris. And, and Tony Vitello just has the boys in the right direction. And I think you and I have talked about this before recently, just that 2022 Tennessee ball club and just 
they might have been one of the most talented teams we've seen in years. Yes, they didn't win at all. And they ran into a red-hot Notre Dame team, right? Mm -hmm. And then Tennessee is, is this unbelievable team that goes to Clemson last year and is that same kind of situation and wins that regional, right? I think what I've seen and heard from Tony Vitello about just the structure of this Tennessee program and just in 2022, they were just just swaggy team, just so much confidence, doing all the right things and just so hyped in all the players. And he knew it. And, and it was – he's calmed down over the years in a great way. He's been a fantastic coach, I think, in general since he's been there in 2017. Fantastic hire, right? But – it got to a point where it was too kind of much in 2022, but he could, he said he couldn't really do anything because they were winning every single game. I think things have kind of, they've learned a lot from that and a lot from last year. And just, he's taken that and has everything more business like focus and just taking care of business, doing it in a quiet, or maybe some people think boring manner, but you're winning baseball. You're winning postseason baseball. And you're taking care of business every day in Knoxville right now. I think it's a great way to put it, Harrison. And I think, too, what you're seeing from Tennessee, the 2022 season where they felt like a shoe-in to win the whole thing, the Notre Dame series happens. I loved what they said on the broadcast over the weekend. It was almost like that hardened them a little bit, where it's like the lessons learned from that, I think, are helping Tennessee immensely. And, you know, it's funny. People hate Tennessee, but it seems like this year's team's kind of likable. Like, I think people actually gravitate towards Tennessee. They still have – a lot of the swag, but they don't want to show up and have a street fight with you like Jordan Beck and Drew Gilbert and some of those guys did. But Drew it's Gilbert, nice, one of the swaggiest players in college baseball history. You no, know, indeed, indeed. But they're not swaggy to a point this year where it like it really rubs people the wrong way. They're actually a really likable club. So not that that matters necessarily, but from the standpoint of it, does not feel like the Tennessee's got that humongous bullseye on their back. And, and to your point, man, that's why I say it just really felt like a a ho-hum weekend for the balls, and, and we knew they were the best team in the Knoxville Regional and you know thought maybe Southern Miss could give them some good games. But I think after last year, being in Lindsey Nelson, had a great crowd there. I, I don't I, – you know, we never had any doubt they were going to make it through. So Yeah, I mean, uh, a great I mean the offensive bats were going to do what they did, right? It was just one of the loudest, most consistent offenses in all of baseball. And the pitching side was more of, hey, if they run into trouble, it's going to be, you know, on the pitching side potentially is where the games would be tighter. And the pitchers took care of business. Mm -hmm. I mean, Drew Beam, outside of Drew Beam, Dream beam. Everyone kind of took care of business. I mean, Xander Seacrest had a pretty good start. Kirby Connell, really good in relief. Nate Snead, really good in relief. AJ Causey, really good. I mean, just that's that's what you need to do and what you expect from your starters and your bullpen, just taking care of business, Chris. Mm, taking care of business, indeed. Let's go to another team, Harrison, that took care of their business and just proved me wrong yet again. I continue to doubt that is the Kentucky Wildcats. I picked Indiana State in this Lexington Regional like a dummy like a dummy, and I paid the price. Kentucky made me pay the price as they run through the Lexington Regional. The bats were red hot this weekend. Again, it was Indiana State, Illinois, Western Michigan. No problem for Kentucky. It's my bad, Harrison. I will wear this one. I doubted Nick Mingione and the boys. It's so easy to doubt Kentucky, and I think they're fueled by that. And again, the sticks were red hot all weekend. Your thoughts on Kentucky advance to the Super and now just being two wins away from their first ever appearance in Omaha. Yeah, Chris, and I, I think you, it's time for you to stop doubting them. Nick Mingione <laughs> in their club, Austin Casino, just the rest of the coaching staff has done an unbelievable job this year. Th this regional, it fell outside of that first game on Friday when they did not deserve to win that game. Just the way that it came, they were up 8 nothing, Chris, and it, it, ended up, it ended up winning 10-8, but the tying run is at, the winning run's at the plate for Western Michigan. Just that was in a way, the sloppiest I've seen Kentucky this year, and I've watched a good a bit of Kentucky more than I've ever watched Kentucky baseball in my life, to be honest with you. It was just an ugly game, but they overcame that, and I think that was a good situation for them to do so against the 14 Western Michigan, and no slouch to Western Michigan. Congrats on them making the tournament. I think that was the situation to do it because they overcame adversity, but it slipped up too much, right? They took care of that, and then they took care of Illinois 6-1, Indiana State 5 nothing. They didn't really, you know, struggle late against, you know, hey, like, our backs are against the wall. You know, they they – they hit some adversity. They figured it out and over, and overcame it. It took four. I mean, Dominic Neiman, he he had a I don't want to say a great start, but he got four innings out of him. You get five runs, but in the late it was in he was shut up through four. But that was positive to see. But you just Kentucky pitching is what's going to be how, determine how far their season goes. And mm -hmm. because we we know their forte is you know playing small ball, scrappy, clean defense, you know button squeeze plays at home. I mean, it was unbelievable I mean, just how they play. I mean, they play really well at home too. And, you got to keep believing the team because they keep proving us right, no matter if you pick them or you don't. They keep proving us right. And Nick Mangione has the Kentucky Wildcats in the Super Regional. 
Yeah, Harrison, excited to talk about their Super Regional matchup. They draw the Oregon State Beavers again. We'll get to that later in the week. But, uh, you know, what Kentucky has done at this point, like you mentioned, Harrison, I, you know, and again, I picked Indiana State. Continue to doubt them at your own peril. They just love to prove people wrong. They did so yet again, like you mentioned. It, on the backs on the backs of Trey Poozer in that game, I mean, he just he, – yeah. sorry, not Trey Poozer. He pitched game two. Mason Moore shot, doing six shutout against mm -hmm. Indiana State. So that yeah. should tell you one thing. And that Indiana State club is solid, too. So, I mean, the Kentucky yeah, – that pitching stepping up and Mason Moore just to do that in, a, in the third starting role, awesome. Yeah, Kentucky rose to the occasion. And, again, I, I feel like they really do thrive on – the fact that they're doubted, they're probably going to be doubted yet again this weekend because I think folks look at the logos and who do they think when they think of college baseball? Probably more so the We'll opponent. touch on that more, yeah. We'll touch on that more later in the week. But uh, great job on Nick Mingio and the boys to get to the Super Regional round. Uh, let's go to Athens, Georgia. Haberson, the Georgia Bulldogs navigate through UNCW, Georgia Tech, Army, this was a little dicey for the dogs at times, starting with Army. I, I mean, from the jump, things were dicey. Georgia finds ways to win some really close games. Um, <clears throat> down to that final game against Georgia Tech, who I thought Tech had them there for a moment. I'll tell you this, Harrison. That final game, that PFP in the bottom of the ninth inning with two outs, bases loaded, that is one of the best plays you will see in a baseball field. That was an insane play where the first baseman goes over he probably should let the second baseman make the play. But listen, the adrenaline, the adrenaline of the moment takes over. You got a guy over there. He hasn't played a lot of first. The play that pitcher made, I mean, it was like a quarterback hitting his receiver in stride, reaches the leg out, touches first. They get out of the inning. Georgia goes on to win that thing. Uh, also, by the way, Georgia was one of the best home run celebrations we've ever seen with the dog mask. That is incredible. Uh, did, yeah. did you see Trey Phelps after I, his I, home run? That's what I'm saying. That that the Trey Phelps where he lifts lifts the leg and one of the best. I, I you know we posted that said is Georgia baseball having fun? Do you think they're having a blast? But kind of a dicey weekend for the dogs, Harrison. But but the bottom line is this: Georgia finds a way to get the supers for the first time since 2008. Your thoughts on Georgia? You know, I, I was encouraged by the fact they were able to win a couple games on the backs of pitching. We did not think that was going to be the case. Also on the backs of some good defense. Um, they're probably going to need to play much better in the Super Regional round to advance. But the bottom line, again, you get to a Super first time over a decade. Thoughts on Georgia? Yeah, it's it's what you talk about pitching is where I, I want to go, and that's because it, it felt like it was more so on the backs of pitching because hitting the, the offense did they did. They scored eight runs against Army, eleven runs against UNCW, and eight runs against Georgia Tech. And that, I mean, the struggles against Army were concerning. Army probably had. A, one of the most consistent pitching staffs top to bottom starting rotation wise in this regional and you know shout out to the men that serve our country thank you for that and just i mean you weren't they were played disciplined baseball and so that was a really tight game i think that was maybe a look ahead game for georgia leighton um leighton finley struggled i mean he only went, he didn't go four innings but he gave up four runs i mean and then he came in and pitched at the end of the uh series at the end of the regional against georgia tech but colton smith gave two runs of four innings i mean not these long outings that we would really hope for from Georgia, you know, and that you really need to go deep in the postseason. And Zach Harris, he went six, but he gave up four earned five runs. I mean, but then Charlie Gold's another pin, and he he was pointing his elbow. He came out. I mean, he didn't even throw it out. He walked the guy, and then he didn't even get a, a single out, and he was holding his elbow. He came out. So that, that's a real concern for me. He, I think he's been one of their best pitchers outside of, um, I mean, you could say Colton Smith, but I, he's been one of their most fun pitchers to watch in Leighton Finley. I, there's concerns there for sure. The offense is always going to be there, especially playing at home when you're 32 and five. But it, it's worrisome because I mean, that was a great way. I mean, to do that to your rival Georgia Tech, and I hate that because I grew up. You know, I'm a Georgia Tech fan, growing up a Georgia Tech household. That was ball four. That was ball four. That's a walk off <laughs> for Tech. I mean, that's that's tough. But I mean, just to make a play like that in that moment just shows kind of the grit and the grind and just the kind of character that feels like Georgia has been just this season and under Wes Johnson and. I mean, if anyone has any doubt that pitchers are athletes, just go watch that play. That's mm -hmm. all I have to say. <laughs> that was a heck of a play, man. I mean, I, I mean, that, that was a, that like that play. I don't know if it will. It might get overlooked down the road, you know, this season or potentially just throughout the rest of the next five, ten years at Georgia. But that's just a legendary play, I think, in Georgia history. Yeah, I mean, especially if they go to Omaha and who knows what can yeah. happen. Um, and against <laughs> against your in-state rival, that was one region. where you know I, I'm typically pretty pretty chill watching games, but that like that drew a reaction from me. I was like, holy crap. Like I, I could not 
believe I was locked that he, in. That that I mean, dude, especially for you know college baseball, that had trouble written all over it. You know what I mean? Like that, that was yeah. one of those like this is your typical. They're gonna throw this ball away. They're gonna lose in excruciating fashion. Um, incredible, incredible play to save the game. But again, Georgia, like you mentioned, um, at Foley Field, it's a bomb. Thirty-two box. and five. You find a way. You simply find a way. That's all that matters. What a job by Wes Johnson, by the way, getting to that point. Um, let's go, Harrison, to College Station, uh, Texas A and M. They do work in their regional advance. The Supers, Louisiana, Texas, Grambling. The one that really stood out, of course, was that rivalry game showdown on Saturday night. Texas took it to the wire. That was a heck of a game. A really fun preview of what we're going to get with A and M and Texas. But the Aggies just too much. You had the ball that bounced off third base, I believe it was, and that was the moment yeah, you kind of knew. Around third. Yeah, this is uh, this is A and M's night. You know, it just it's meant to be, and it seems like breaks like that kind of happen when you're at the home ballpark. Why it's so important to host. And I thought Bluebell was a madhouse. I mean, Bluebell was rocking the bubbles. Did you get enough bubbles. The bubbles were blowing. Uh, Braden Montgomery, Jace Lavalette, the entire crew gave him a lot of reasons to do so. The ball five chants were, were were rocking. They were had. Your thoughts on Texas A and M and you know, it wasn't a ho hum weekend, Haberson. That Texas game was electric, but outside of that, I mean, A and M pretty much just had their way. You know, they had Louisiana in the final game to clinch it and took care of business against them. And uh, I would call that a a really successful weekend for Texas A and M. Yeah, and I mean, you obviously pitch off against Grambling, just probably one of the weaker four seeds in the regional, and not use Ryan Prager there. They used Tanner Jones. He went three shutout innings, even though he gave up seven hits. Um, the offense did its thing. You know, it was it it was more Ted Burton than kind of the top of the lineup that we've seen. I mean, the top of the lineup went, had one hit, I think, in nine at-bats in the first game of scrambling. And in Texas, just an unbelievable. You knew it was going to be that close, kind of felt like a low-scoring game. I mean, it you couldn't have asked for a better game, a better script. You know, Texas, Texas A&M, regional, postseason baseball. They're about to be rivals in the SEC. And you get Ryan Prager on the mound versus uh, LeBaron Johnson Jr. Just – Someone who has been – LeBaron Johnson has been such a high-profile guy and just hasn't really fit the mold of expectation or lived up to the hype that he is, but has, is such a talented player. And to have Ryan Prager and LeBaron Johnson Jr. go head-to-head, and he, Ryan Prager just kind of outduels him in a sense. Just He goes just over six innings, seven Ks, four hits, two, two earned. LeBaron shoved his probably best out of the year. To lock up a lineup like that and go five, two hit innings – sorry, five innings, two hit ball, eight Ks, one earned against the eight in lineup – that was probably one of the best pitching outings that I think outside of Hagen Smith that Aina has seen. And they still played well. I mean, yes, they only scored four runs, but they played really well. It was it was just a tough, gritty, old school kind of game. And then that yeah, one ball bounced the wrong way. Texas could possibly win that game if that had happened, but that's just baseball. Those plays like that happen, like the Georgia game, making that play is just the difference maker. And that was the difference maker in that game for the AM um to come out on top. I mean, they won four two. It was just an unbelievable game to watch. Great game for just fans to watch, but then and they took care of business championship game. They didn't let, I mean, they gave it four runs to Louisiana. They didn't let them hang around though. I mean, just out hit them right on the backs of Brayton Montgomery Four RBI game. I mean, just unbelievable for me. Grohovic had two RBIs, but then Shane Sado, he started and started the championship game and he hasn't been one of their main guys. He goes just over five, one earned innings, six hits. I mean, no walk six K's. And he was just unbelievable. Justin Lankin though, struggled at the bullpen for me. That was, just continue to be concerned. I mean, Chris Cortez is your bullpen guy. And just, Chris, I think he's one of the best relievers in baseball right now in college baseball, just with, he throws 99, 100 miles an hour, and 94, yes. and a six mile an hour sinker. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's unbelievable. He had, he almost struck out everything when he faced in almost mm. three innings. It was insane. So it, it was awesome to see that it was a great regional, great for baseball. And Texas has, had a tight one against, sorry, Texas didn't have a tight one against Texas, but, you know, Good teams win close games like that against rivals in postseason. And Harrison, I, my biggest takeaway from AM over the weekend, I think the best sign for them is oh. that the month of May is over. And just like the Atlanta Braves, Braden Montgomery did not like the month of May. He's all of a sudden finding his stroke. So mm-hmm. you get him rolling. He had a big weekend in that regional. That spells mm-hmm. trouble for everybody else. And that's the I thing that the, the line's so deep that like he doesn't play well. And like everyone else, kind of step, someone else steps up. It's the same thing mm-hmm. with Tennessee. The lineup's so deep that someone else can step up and they can win ball games. Mm-hmm. Texas A&M, thirty-five yeah. and three at home, Chris. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's Bluebell. I, I mentioned this over the weekend. I don't know why it doesn't get more respect as one of the most 
electric atmospheres in college baseball. It's on my bucket list for sure. That place was rocking over the weekend. Um, Harrison, let's go to, and there's a reason I saved this one for last of the teams that are advancing. The Florida Gators come out of the loser's bracket in Stillwater. Oklahoma State, Nebraska, Niagara, the others. Florida navigates all of them. They beat Oklahoma State on Monday afternoon to secure their spot in the Super Regionals. And Harrison, maybe not to you, maybe not to some others, but I I feel like this was, there there was a good surprise and a not so good surprise. This was the positive surprise of the weekend. Florida, a team that folks were debating this time last week, Harrison, should they even be in the field of 64? One game over 500. College of Charleston folks and many others complaining that Florida, why are they in the postseason? This team stinks. They're no good. Hell, I had my my takes about Florida. I didn't think they were very – I thought they should be in. Didn't think they were a very good ball club. The pieces come together, man. And the irony, Harrison, of, of it is this. Florida's biggest reason they struggled this season, especially in the midweek, Lack of pitching depth. Why did they win the Stillwater Regional? Well, pitching depth comes through. Their pitchers come through. They win a couple low-scoring games. Thoughts on Florida, man? I mean, we knew they had talent, but I I did not expect them to put it together on the road. I thought Okie State had this thing, especially when you looked earlier in the weekend, Florida all the way out of the loser's bracket. Your thoughts on the Gators? Yeah, Chris, and it it was just an unbelievable – series we knew that something was going to happen with florida whether it was just you know a, a high scoring shootout game that they didn't end up losing you know possibly going two and q or you know playing for a regional final and i told we talked about this remember we said who are you taking lsu or florida going to the postseason and make noise i said both are probably going to do it but watch watch florida go on a run here in the postseason they have all the talent on paper they are one of the most talented teams top 25 team in the country for sure let alone probably a top 10 team talent wise but just haven't put together and Dare I say this might be Kevin O'Sullivan's best coaching job? I mean, I just for the fair. talent this yeah. season they've had and just the struggles and inconsistencies and just to go and do this on the road, you're 9-12 and 12 on the road and to go through this and a hostile environment that that I think Oklahoma State's a fantastic ballpark and just a great regional ballpark, a slugfest for you know hitters for sure, against a, one of the best teams in the country and a really red-hot Oklahoma State team. And to go do this on the backs of, yes, you're hitting because that we knew was kind of the backbone and if, that was kind of going to hold the team, but to do it on the backs of pitching, I mean, you outpitch Brett Sears at Nebraska, or not outpitch, you outlast Brett Sears in Nebraska in game one. I mean, just Liam Peterson, young guy at Florida, he's going to be a great kind of staple piece for them. He he has a great outing. It sets you up for success, right? You They had to win that game one, Chris, to go on to have a chance at winning this regional. They had to, but then you run into a, an Oklahoma State, Brian Holiday, one of the uh, elite pitchers in college baseball right now. Those are Two hit shot, a two out, two hit, one run, complete game. I mean, against what he just dominated them. And Cag struggled, obviously, in his start, giving up several home runs and just some some big old home runs. But the ball was, was, was flying out of Stillwater, it, it was, and we knew it was. But it was, it was flying, it was unbelievable. I think there there were more home runs though. It wasn't the most home run regional in in the of the weekend. It was Fayetteville actually. Mm. So that I think it was number two behind that, but. Cags obviously struggle on the mound, and that's like that's been your your kind of your stud on the mound. You know, we, every Sunday it feels like Cags has started the season. It felt like they've you know won or been right there. They've lost I think two games in the regular season with him pitching. One of them I think was in maybe in the SEC uh, tournament or whatnot. It was at the end of the season against Mississippi State maybe. Um, but then to do it on the back to pitching, it just it felt like it was the whole staff, right? Mm. It, 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 I mean, not to be long with, with with it, but then you play Nebraska again. And it's a bullpen game, but guys just step up. I mean, Pierce Capella has a kind of an okay start, right? And then you have Jamison Fisher out of the bullpen. He struggles. And then other guys are just next guy, who's next guy, next guy, next guy, and taking care of business. And Florida really did that. And I don't want to say a clean way. It was really gutsy performance from the hitters, obviously, but then the pitching. I mean, then you had Cade Fisher. You got to beat Oklahoma State twice, a very good Oklahoma State team twice at their ballpark. Cade Fisher, kind of a shorter start, really good. And Brandon Neely. I mean, can we say his best outing of the year? Oh, five and two thirds of one hit ball, 11 strikeouts, Chris, 11, no runs. I mean, that was the best we've probably seen him all year. And it was the moment that Florida needed it. It was the most crucial moment of Florida season that they needed. And he just, to step up and do that, I think really gave them momentum and momentum swing. I mean, just throughout that game to win that. And it's like, 
hey, anything can happen in a game seven. You, I mean, that's the kind of the the forte of baseball. In game seven, everyone's available. Anything can happen. And to have to have like younger guys on the mound step up in that championship game, which is it was it was really cool to watch. No one blew any wild away, but just gutsy performance. Fisher Jamison to come out. I mean, to, to close out the last three plus innings of no hit baseball, it was unbelievable. And just, it, I mean, he retired all everyone he faced. Mm. It, it was just, it was so cool to see and see Florida, just the team that we've seen and expected them to be all year, the talent they had. And I mean, wow, to go on the road and do this, I definitely think it's one of Kevin and Sullivan's best, if not best, coaching jobs. It, it was really fun to see some of those pitchers you mentioned rise of the occasion. Fisher Jamison has almost cemented himself as. A legend now in Gator circles. An awesome name, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed. And Brandon Neely was electric, like you mentioned. So uh, yeah. Colby Shelton, I thought, had a couple of big knocks as well. That's a good sign for Florida. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this Florida team, man, that, uh, you know, I, I was even joking on Saturday, Harrison, when you and I were hanging out. You know, I ranked Kevin O'Sullivan as the number one coach coming into this season in the SEC. And I was like, man, how dumb of a pick was that? Now I sit here and I'm like, well, maybe that wasn't so dumb of a pick. It, it just – the model of consistency there in Gainesville, Harrison, get this. Florida has now been to the Super Regionals 10 of Sully's 17 years there. I mean, that's that's insane. That's insane. If people don't, if people don't realize how crazy that is, that's insane. To be that yeah, and, consistently good. But that's what they've and done. It now. took everything for this one to, to perform it to win this. I mean, they had 21 different, like 21 guys take them out. Yes, some guys pitched twice, but 21 different, you know, guys come in and pitch in on the mound. Just it was such a full team effort, gutsy performance. Kevin Sullivan making the right moves at the right time. That those bats, you know, you know, keeping them around, giving them a chance, and then the, the pitching to step up. I mean, it was. I don't know. I mean, yes, people are going to have concerns. I think people are either going to have concerns for Florida still. Oh, they kind of snuck by, whatnot, or oh, everyone's going to be in the backs of Florida now. It's going to be really interesting to see in the super regional, kind of how it plays out and what Kevin O'Sullivan's kind of philosophy and strategy is with this but it's i mean it's to do that that often to go to the postseason and to be that successful postseason that often it's that's not normal mm -hmm. and i think we've kind of cut into that in the sec just with how strong and how good the sec is to expect teams and coaches to do that year after year after year you know some some programs the standard is omaha some programs the standard is the postseason you know whatnot but I mean, Kevin Sullivan, just a phenomenal coaching job in his career, and just especially this season, like I said. Mm -hmm. So, Harrison, we talked about the teams that have punched their ticket to the Super Regionals. Again, there are five SEC teams with a shot to go to Omaha, but there are six that are sitting at home right now. They got eliminated. Let's talk about them really quickly. And we have to start, Harrison, with the shocker of the weekend. Can you believe some idiot picked Arkansas to win the whole thing last week? Can you believe that? Oh, yeah, that was me. I picked Arkansas to win the whole that thing was also in my me. bracket. That was also – okay, all right, cool. Well, that did not happen. Not only did that not happen, the Fayetteville Regional, the Arkansas Razorbacks fall. Kansas State comes out of the Fayetteville Regional that consisted of Arkansas, La Tech, and SEMO, the other teams. Harrison, there ain't a thing we can say to make Arkansas fans feel better because, I, I mean, listen, you can give all the credit you want to to SEMO or K-State or whoever else – Arkansas imploded. Arkansas dropped the ball. Are the Hogs cursed? Maybe this was a cataclysmic failure for Arkansas baseball. Yeah, Chris, and it, it really was kind of predicated on the pitching. The thing that has gotten them to where they are this season. Which is the crazy it, part. That's the crazy part of all this. And it felt like it was every game. It felt like it was every game. I mean, you, you pitch off. You have Mason Molina start game one. After you, you put him in the bullpen for a little bit, and he has a short start, four earned, and then you have your who could have like had the potential and has all the ability and stuff to be one of the best relievers in the country. And I think at one point he was one of the best relievers in the SEC, if not the country. And Will McIntyre, and he struggled. He gave up four runs in less than two innings to Simo, four seed. Like I mean, shout out to them for winning the OBC. But you, sh <laughs> there's no reason that they should be doing that against a team like Simo if you're Arkansas, let alone an SEC team. In as much as I wanted to say it's more impressive they scored 17 runs on 16 hits, I, I can't because you give up nine runs and just it felt like all week and the pitching struggled. And the pitching has been their backbone, their staple, what has got them here. And they're at home, Chris, at home. They've lost three games all year at home, all year. And then they lose two in almost 24 hours 
on the back load of pitching. And then Hagen Smith against a Kansas State team who had a lot of potential. They were really good. Seeing Hagen Smith get touched up was hard to believe. Yeah. It really was. I mean, it they, was hard to believe. Kansas State is one of the best relievers, I think, in the country and neighbors. And then to go and – I mean, they don't have, like, this overpowered lineup that we don't think – that we no one really says, oh, Kansas State, just monster lineup, you know, like a Florida or, you know, a Tennessee or an A&M. But to get touch up Hagen Smith and, yes, he struggled last outing. We were like, oh, maybe, you know, it's it's Hoover. It was a short outing, you know, a short week. Didn't want to – don't make much of it. And Dave Van Horn said the same thing, you know, going into that game against uh, – I can't remember who he pitched against in Hoover. But then he just go, – he goes five. I mean – you used to think that's a lock for a win, right? That's a lock for a win if Hagen's on the mound in a double-digit strikeout game. It wasn't either one of those. He got six earned. Chris. Six. It, he was he was fine through the first four and then give up a six spot in the fifth. I mean, talk about a a, a dagger in the back. I mean, you're down six two, and you're not an offensive team, and you just had Hagen Smith on the bump. I mean, Ben Bybee, I think, held it together for them for the most part after that, but. It's crazy because Arkansas out hit Kansas State. They had 13 hits, which it, it just doesn't feel like it. It feels like when they hit Arkansas, like they don't hit a ton. But when they do at home, it's just been clutch, you know, hits right here, clutch with runners in score position, but not often. But they just they didn't have enough firepower. And then to lose to Simo, I mean, after that, I don't even know how to describe that first game, which is unbelievably wild game. To lose to Simo, I think it, it, it was just it's frustrating, Chris. It's frustrating as I think SEC fans, but it's frustrating as Arkansas fans. I can't imagine what they're kind of feeling right now and just how good of a program they are consistently year after year and just the struggles they've had of not ever winning a national championship. I mean, 2018, I know all Arkansas Razorbacks fans are going to hate me for this, and it's, they're, it's ingrained in their memory, dropping that fly ball behind first place and losing the game to Oregon State and then losing the national championship game that next game. But and it, I don't know if it's just – I mean, you don't know what to do, really. It, it feels mm. weird because the backbone, like I said, of pitching struggled all weekend, and that's what lost. It, it the series. feels and mental. Regional. It feels mental at this point, Harrison, to a point to where I'm almost convinced that the year that Arkansas wins it all is going to come in a year when they're on the road for a regional, and they don't have the pressure. Like they just, they just don't deal with that well. Like I kind of scoffed last week at some of the Arkansas folks that we are buddies with. They were joking, like, "Hey." Never know, Fayetteville Regional, what could go wrong for our Hogs, right? Like, I mean, it's Arkansas in the post. I'm like, dude, come on. There's no way. Well, let's not kid ourselves. And I'm like, maybe there's something to this. Like, Arkansas just has this mental block where it's like, I think the year they win it all, they're going to be like an old Miss was a couple years ago or an un- where they can fly under the radar, have less expectations, have a chip on the shoulder. Maybe they would fare better in that kind of setting and and not having postseason baseball at home and and not having all the pressures and I mean I don't know man I mean that's just because it just I mean, but they're so it, good it at sense. home but they weren't but they weren't they were but they weren't I mean dude it's yeah. Mom Walker was a morgue dude and it it's uh it was one of the most sad things I think we talked about this Harrison at some point of the last week or so there's nothing worse than when you get knocked out of your own regional. And you have to sit there and watch the other teams play there. And, and I it. and I caught a little bit of the Kansas State SEMO game on I think it was Sunday night. There might have been like 500 people there. <laughs> like, you know, and it's just so weird watching it. It's like, man, that hurts to see. So Arkansas fans. You know, what's, just, what's, what's wild, Chris? You gotta think they're not they haven't been an offensive team. I don't really think they outside of 2018, maybe in just kind of a full team effort on like all fronts. They haven't been an off, a really good offensive team since Tony Vitello left to take the Tennessee job in 2017. Mm. And look at Tennessee's offense. Yeah. I mean, coincidence? <laughs> I mean, back when Tony Vitello was at Arkansas, I was looking at it the other day, I think yesterday maybe, they were a very much better offensive team, batting about 280, 290. Uh, I think 2016 or 2015, they were just, they had multiple guys with 40, 50 RBIs. It's kind of trickled down since then. It's just, it's really turned into a pitching kind of factory, if you could say that. But just the offense has just slowly regressed year after year after Tony Vitello left. So, mm. Haverson, let's go to what happened in Charlottesville, Mississippi State. Uh, I thought a valiant effort by the Dogs. You know, we we both, I believe, picked them to come out of Charlottesville. This is more so a situation where I give a lot of credit to Virginia. That's a really, really good ball club. They were tough to beat at home. The most impressive thing. Virginia does it swinging the stick. They do it with offense. They beat Mississippi State with pitching. That's not exactly 
how folks expected that to go. We did have a great moment from State in the uh, the walk-off from Dakota Jordan against St. John's. A couple of really fun games against St. John's. But at the end of the day, Virginia finds a way. Things got sloppy there for State at the end. But uh, And I know it's a bitter end of the season. But I, I, I more so give Virginia the credit for being a high-caliber club and taking care of business at home. Thoughts on Mississippi State's season ending in the Charlottesville Regional? Yeah, I think outside looking in to Starkville, I think it was a really good season, especially after the two seasons they've kind of had recently after winning the national championship and just the struggles that concerns that people have for Chris Lamonis coming in. I and, the way it and the way it started. And the way it started. started. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, outside of, I guess, starting SEC play, when you take the series from LSU, who didn't look – it looked good then and then didn't look good during the season later, and then now it looks better. I mean, I think it was a really good season. They had a lot of good pieces. They they had a, a really tough host. I mean, if you put them in a couple other regionals with certain hosts, I'm not going to say who or, or who not, but I think they win probably win that regional. Just Virginia just mm-hmm. is probably one of the best ACC teams or outside of the SEC team in hitting. They have one of the most explosive offenses in the country, you could say, for sure. And we both thought just the caliber at which Mississippi State pitching has been this year with Cal Stevens. I mean, first off, they're in a tight game at St. John's. I mean, that shouldn't have happened for sure. St. John's is not a bad team, but when you have Cal Stevens go eight innings, two earn 10 Ks, no walks, you shouldn't be in a tight game at St. John's and winning an extras. But then you have Drangelo Sinjin, you're like, all right, we're feeling good, right? We have Drangelo Sinjin against, who's a very, very good pitcher, elite pitcher, top two round pitcher for sure. And he pitches pretty solid against Virginia and it holds their offense to four runs. You got to be able to score four or five runs against Virginia, I think. And we knew it was going to be on the backs of the offense is if Dakota Jordan and Hunter Hines stepped up because in Hoover, I think they would have combined one for 28. If I'm, if I'm, I think it's about one for 20 yeah. or one for 26. We knew that wasn't going to last as talented and as athletic, athletic as they both are. We knew that wasn't going to last. And I mean, postseason baseball kind of, I think it gave them a little refresh rejuvenation. And then to say that Dakota Jordan, just that he was one of the key pieces of with Hunter Hines and to do that, hit that, that home run. I mean, he had an incredible day. I mean, I think he, what he goes four for four, just kind of base hits and whatnot doubles. And then he hits a bomb. I mean, un- unbelievable to see him and just, he's such a good player to watch. So fun, so athletic. And he, I mean, four RBIs in the game against St. John's and they just blow him out. And that's what they should have done, right? They should have done that. And they're pitching. They, they, Brooks Iger pitched really well. And then you got to beat Virginia tech. They're sorry, Virginia twice at home. That's just, it's a really tough situation. And you're deep in regional, you're deep in your pitching, right? You don't have your kind of two studs in the mound. And Brooks Iger has been a really good pitcher and just kind of, I mean, I think they played well. It kind of just got away from them. Mm-hmm. But it's just, when, when your top guys in the lineup were producing two RBIs total, it, it, you're not going to win ballgame against a Virginia team that it feels like everyone on that team has an RBI, well, at least an RBI game on average. And so it, it it's tough, but it was such it was such a fun regional. They're such a really good team to watch, and they really grew up this season. And I think they exceeded what more people's expectations were of them this season than not. Haberson, thoughts on state fans that still want Chris Lamonis ran out of town? Because there are there are a number of them. There are a number of them, believe it or not. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think he should be on the hot seat at all. I think just some people are going to say their national championship year twenty twenty one was a fluke. I don't think so at all. It wasn't like they were last four and then win it all like um, like Ole Miss. They were such a talented team. They have a lot of talented players. Justin Parker is a very very good pitching coach there, and you see what he's done there so far. Mm-hmm. I mean, just the guy. It's not like these guys, these perennial guys, come in the season. It's like. Oh, like these guys are gonna be studs. You know, we've made a Hagen Smith, they have a Mason Molina, a Friday night guy from Texas and in transferring in. I mean, Durant Lissing, we've known about him for a couple of years now, but just I think they've kind of flown under the radar pitching wise, and they just have had a really good pitching season as a whole. And that's on the backs of the, the players and then the coaching from Justin Parker. But it's just it wasn't consistent. You didn't have guys that were con- like the power guys weren't consistent or clutch when they needed to be as often as other teams were. I, I think I think it was a really talented team. They just didn't it's hard because Mississippi State fans now expect Omaha to be their is their is their standard, right, Chris? Mm, yeah. I mean, it feels like most of the SEC expects that, but after you win a national championship, you kind of expect Omaha to be the standard, right? Mm. We are an Omaha team. We, like postseason is enough. We're an Omaha team, minimum super regional. I, I, I don't think he's on the hot seat at all. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think Lamonis, even after as harsh as I was on him early in the season, I think again to your point, the way the, the season harshest. started, the, <laughs> the way the season started. 
how they finished up, I, I think it was actually a pretty impressive run for the dogs. And I think that uh, I think it's a positive sign for the future. So we'll, we'll see what yeah. it holds. I mean, uh, Virginia's yeah. no slouch. They, they are an <clears throat> Omaha team, an Omaha yeah. club. Yeah. Like that, that is their standard. And they do that year after year after year. And Brian, I mean, Brian O'Connor is just a fantastic coach there. I mean, like I said, if you were in another regional, you probably win it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, give credit to UVA. That is a really, really high quality club. Uh, speaking of high quality clubs, Harrison, let's go to the Chapel Hill regional. This one concluding on Monday night. Uh, North Carolina takes down LSU in a game seven winner take all. It looked like LSU. Had some magic left in their run. Uh, that drop pop fly is one they're going to be talking about for a long time in Baton Rouge is one that cost them. But, uh, you know, give North Carolina credit. Extremely talented. Vance Honeycutt's one of the best players in college baseball. I think UNC is another one of those ACC programs because we're kind of locked in on SEC. We don't watch as much or obviously talk about as much, but that's one of the best clubs in the country. Uh, your thoughts on LSU just seem like they ran out of gas a little bit. I mean, I, I thought it was a really hard fought well-fought series for them, well-fought regional, just not enough in the end. Yeah, Chris, I mean, UNC is a, is a powerhouse in the ACC. I don't think they've won a national championship yet. I think they have 11 college world series appearances, but they just, it feels like they always are in the Supers in the in Omaha. But it, to, to talk about LSU, obviously, they're a two seed. We talked about them being, no one wants to have them in, as a two seed regional, and we know UNC didn't, and it went down to the wire. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was I mean, it's probably one of the best. It was, I think, overall the best like, results from a regional we got of any regional, just with UNC's walk off, like, almost blown against LIU, and then just the games we've had with it was LSU. an electric and, regional. It was it an was, electric and, and, regional. And then the calls from Mike Monaco is unbelievable. I mean, just it was a lot of it was just everything you wanted, I think, in a regional. And we knew it was going to be an SEC team somewhere, right? Mm. I mean, LSU a two seed, probably one of the most dangerous two seeds, getting hot at the right time. Chris, this is the first time in NCAA uh, history since I believe the expansion in 99, that no two seed has made a super regional. Two seeds want to combine 19 and 32 this season, which is, is shocking because we thought this was going to be the year the deadly two seed, right? It was the year the deadly three seed. But to, to dive more into LSU, I mean, you got you got prime Thatcher Hurd. You got a fantastic outing from him. I mean, just almost six innings, two earned, no walk, six Ks. I mean, just, it felt like what you'd expect from Thatcher Hurd and what you were standard was for him coming into LSU from UCLA. Him, it's just a great outing from him. The bullpen, Gavin Gidry, I thought was great all weekend. And just, we knew that the hitting was going to be there. It was going to be such a great game. And to then to force a game seven winner take all because your offense is productive and the pitching stepped up. I mean, we, we say it, anything can happen in a game seven, right? Anything can happen. But I, I don't know if it's LSU fans going to be talking about that catch going down in history as like a stain on the season or like that was what lost us because you give a base hit uh, the next. I think batter or so, and that was what scored the runner. You know, you, there had chances early in the game. And when you look at it, I mean, they started Sam, Sam Dutton. He just, I mean, he struggled at the gate. I mean, he, he didn't even go in any. He didn't even go give it an out, and he gave two runs. And you're in a hole like that to fit against a UNC team on the road. And you saw the atmosphere, Chris. That was, there was kids watching on the stands of other stadiums in UNC, <laughs> in Chapel Hill. I mean, it was the same thing we saw in Clemson. There was guys on the athletic center because they, they couldn't get tickets. They were watching the game tailgate, and they were rowdy. I mean, it was a rowdy atmosphere in Chapel Hill. One Chapel Thrill. Let's talk about Chapel Thrill, right? I mean, it felt like postseason baseball. It felt like, I mean, because if LSU win that game, they're hosting a Super Regional. Mm -hmm. Which, if you after the start, they had 3-12 and 12 in SEC play. If you told LSU fans they were 1-1 away from hosting a Super Regional, I mean, I, that was definitely an incentive and motivation for sure amongst just the standard of coming off a national championship. But Will Helmers, we got to talk about Will Helmers, right? To go, to step up in that situation against a very good UNC team, an offensive UNC team, and go almost six innings, a two-hit shutout ball. I mean, talk about putting the back on the team on your back and to give them an opportunity, hey, go out and swing it and to say, tell the offense, you know, go win this game you got to have a lot of faith in that, right, Chris? I mean, just the clutchness that they had on the offensive end and to have a pitcher like that, not, not one of your main staple guys. It wasn't like a Gavin Gidry. It wasn't a Gage Herring or a Gap, sorry, Griffin Herring. To, to do that, I mean, that I felt that gave him motivation. I was like, LSU is going to come out and win this maybe. I mean, I really think they did. I mean, especially weirdly enough, and we can obviously talk more about it, you know, at some other point, but just the whole home and away situation, I, I think is really weird. I think under no circumstance, the home team should be 
away. The team hosting a regional should be away in a game seven. I, no, no, no circumstance should that happen. Mm -hmm. But that's how it was. And you're like, LSU, we've seen this before. We've seen it plenty of times. Bottom, bottom of the ninth, bottom of the ninth, they're, they, they're going to walk it off, right? It just felt like something special was going to happen for this LSU team. It didn't. And you have Gage jump. Yes, he was the one on now after coming in after 102 pitches, I think, on Friday. And he looked really good. I don't think he looked 100%, obviously, but he looked good. But it, it just wasn't enough. They didn't have that one extra hut, a clutch hit. You know, you thought maybe it was going to be a Michael Braswell. It was maybe going to be, you know, a Josh Pearson who's been hot. And, I mean, let alone Tommy White. You have, you have the top order come up. The situation was set up. The script was there. Just UNC held out and held the line. And it felt, I think as college baseball fans, it felt fitting that the last out was a absolute missile to center and Vance Honeycutt catching it and securing it. So it was an unbelievable regional, Chris. Yeah, I, I thought that You can tell might, by how excited <clears throat> I am. I, I thought that ball might get down on LSU. You know, their magic, they might find a way. But uh, like you mentioned, man, so many guys stepped up and <clears throat> North Carolina coming out on top. And again, that was probably the most entertaining regional we had all weekend. So um, we had two teams, Harrison, go two and Q. Bama and Vandy, really quickly, your, your thoughts on them. I'm saving South Carolina for last because there's – more to discuss with them than just the yeah. play on the field. Uh, Bama, Vandy, anything to take away? I mean, again, I, I we didn't expect Bama to do very, fairly well, and I think we you both expected. Vandy. Yeah, I, I did pick Vandy. I, I will own that. But uh, Bama, we both saw, I think, 2 and Q more than likely. Vandy blew up my face. Again, they went 2 and Q. Shout out to them. Well, I won't say they allowed it. High Point took and got their first ever postseason win over an SEC team. Uh Thoughts on the two teams in the SEC that went to and barbecue over the weekend? Yeah, to be quick, I mean, obviously, we talked about Alabama going one and done in Hoover and just like they haven't played it, felt like in almost two weeks or a week and a half, you know, it just felt like slow. And I was like, they really got to get it going. You know, Ben has to struggle with it. I mean, when he pitches well, they they play well. And you have Gage, you have, you have Gage Miller and um, TJ McCants, two elite athletes on the team, and just it, they didn't have enough. You know, it felt like in and out for them, right? And, and that's how it obviously felt for Vanderbilt, too. I mean, we knew. If they're going to win, it's going to be on the back. So they're pitching. The pitching wasn't there. It kind of felt like Arkansas. They didn't have enough hitting. But just how inconsistent, how poor they play on the road, and how – I mean, the pitching statistics aren't even that good on the road. But we thought it was going to be enough to, you know, push Clemson potentially. And it just wasn't – I mean, you got a hot coast on coast that wants to be in a shootout. And, I mean, they didn't, they didn't even get to that point, really, you know. And it, it just – it didn't. Carter Holton wasn't himself. And it just it, – it felt – I mean, you had – they lose the – they lose the high point on a game which you should put the runner on, and then you have a you have a dull play set up. I mean, it was an open base at first. It was, it, it felt like, I don't want to say, Tim Corbin was kind of starting to get it over with, but it felt like the season was just like, all right, this is this is kind of it. So, it, it was surprising to see Vandy's pitching let them down. I mean, I I looked at you right when it was five to nothing, and I thought, hey. Vandy's got this in the bag, man. They're good. I thought you, you literally said they had it in the bag. I said I was like, I had they got it in the bag. Know. You're like, I don't know, postseason baseball. And sure enough, uh, that wasn't even remotely enough. And and again, shout out to High Point. That it was a really it was a really impressive performance, by the way, from High Point, the Clemson region, yeah, their first High time Point ever really in well. the postseason. Uh, again, they've now got a postseason win over an SEC team. So there you go. But yeah, it was a hapless performance from Bama, from Vandy. Uh, I think Vandy fans are probably more up in arms than Bama fans. Again, that, that Bama, I think you could see that coming from a mile away. But the performance by Vanderbilt, surprising. And, and I mean, too, to start it off the, the way they did. Program. Yeah, yeah. To, to, for, for Vandy to start it off the way they did and get crushed by Coastal, have a guy get locked in the bathroom. They had guys fouling balls off their knees. Which I think has happened. Yeah. Which I think they had guys happened two years ago. Yeah. Long, yeah. They had guys. They had guys. They had a, a Vastine get sick. It was just like everything. all get hurt. He came out. Yeah. That was their their main it, power source. It was everything that could have went wrong, did go wrong for Vandy, and of course led to their early exit. Uh, finally, Harrison, I saved South Carolina for last because the Gamecocks had more than just an early exit happen. They fall on the Raleigh Regional NC State advances. South Carolina sees their season end on Sunday, losing to James Madison 2 0. But it's more so about the after effect. Mark Kingston has been fired as South Carolina's head coach. This was something I called for weeks ago. This was something I called for two years ago, if you've been following me long enough. But this is something that I think we talked about a couple weeks ago, felt like this is something that needed to be done. Your thoughts on South Carolina's performance and then the firing of Mark Kingston? Yeah, and we knew it was going to be kind of a scrappy game with JMU. Just JMU, one of the last four teams we believed to be in. 
and just how the style of South Carolina's played this season is really scrappy, hard nosed games. They, you know, have found ways to win, especially playing at home and just kind of on the backs of Cole Messino because Ethan Petri wasn't the same Ethan Petri we saw last year. And I don't know why JMU pitched to Cole Messina. Uh, doesn't make sense to me still. I mean, I'm not saying he's CAGS or Condon, but you don't pitch him in that situation. He's one of, if not the hottest hitters in the country right now. And I mean, that's why JMU lost that game and why South Carolina won it. Um, but then, I mean, it's, I, I didn't pick them to win this regional just because of the inconsistencies. They did have the best pitching staff statistically in this region, which is really weird to say, but I didn't think they had the consistent offense to keep up with NC State. I mean, you lose you lose 6-4 to them. I mean, the pitching, I think, pitched very, like, played really well. Garrett Ganey starting as we kind of expected. He gave you six hard innings. I mean, four runs. I mean, you got to score more than four runs, I think, in any game to mm. win if you don't have elite pitching like a Hagen Smith throughout the season, not postseason. Um, and then to lose two to JMU, it's just, it's the standard. To get, the standard to get Columbia, shut out by JMU, first shutout yeah. of the year. For the Dylan James Madison pitched pitching really well, though. He went, he gave up one earned over over five innings. I mean, it just, it just felt like God, it was just frustrating, right? It's frustrating for, I think, SEC fans, but specifically South Carolina fans. Chris, the standard in Columbia, I don't want to say has been lost, but has been mislocated. The standard in Columbia, at South Carolina, is super regionals in Omaha. It has gotten away from that. It needs to get back to that. And I, I think a change is what is going to potentially get it back on top of the mountain to the upper third of the mountain, right? Of super regionals of Omaha. And it, it just felt like it wasn't going to get there, right? I mean, you could say it's the, the talent, the recruiting, the Mark Kingston, you know, coaching, whatnot, the performance of players. I mean, most of this, most of the seniors, Chris, I know you saw this year were transfers for guys that transferred in. I mean, a couple of them are from Clemson. And then you just have Monty Lee come over from Clemson, the head coach, to be an associate head coach in South Carolina. That was just a weird situation. But the player's been raving to keep him. He's been named the interim. It, it just felt like – the sta- it feels like the standard has changed from Super Regionals in Omaha to postseason, and that is not what South Carolina Gamecock baseball is. And it felt like just there's been some settling. I don't want to say in the clubhouse because that's not true. Those players expect to be playing Super Regionals in Omaha. It just – it the pieces have – they're not. They got the wrong pieces in the wrong place. It's just pieces aren't fitting together right now, and a change is what I think is going to fix that. Hamerson, I was asked, believe it or not, Tuesday morning about looking back on the Mark Kingston era. How would I summarize it? And I had not thought of that yet. And when I look back on it, you know, to your point, the the standard. I'll, I'll say the standard ha- has been lost. It has. Um, when you've got your head coach to, at, being asked after the game. Do you feel like uh, it was a successful season or was the season a failure? He says, no, we made the postseason. When you got your ball club, and I didn't say anything a couple weeks ago or I guess a week ago, when you got your ball club celebrating and hooping and hollering because they're going on the road for a regional like they just won the College World Series, that used to be a bad year in Columbia. So the standard got lost. And when you look back on the Mark Kingston era, there were some highs, you know. There were a couple super regionals mixed in there. That was the there was that the first super regional was his first year on the backs of yeah. someone else's for, uh, recruiting program, right? So and I think so, that has to be yeah that year. that has to be taken into account. But I mean, there there were highs, but it was marred by inconsistencies. By you know, the lows were really really low, and again, the inconsistencies of the program. That's what you felt during the Mark Kingston era. And, I mean, again, I, I think it was a microcosm of the Kingston era, that final game against James Madison, and really all throughout the weekend where South Carolina couldn't play defense, and if it wasn't pitching, it was hitting, and vice versa. And it just it just never clicked, to your point, Harrison. And I, I said it, it before. Fe- yeah, go ahead. It felt like a lot of games for South Carolina were much closer than they needed to be or playing from behind. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I would just – I will say it again. It was the most no-brainer decision of all time. So I, I'm curious where South kind of goes. I mean, listen, Mark Kingston knew he was on the chopping block. He was asked on Sunday after they lost about, do you feel like you have the the support of you know the administration? His response was, we know everyone at South Carolina wants to win and has high expectations. End of sentence. So, What do you expect him to say, though? But, I mean, I, I'm just saying he didn't resoundingly say, yes, I know we've got the full support. We're building something. He just said, we know everybody wants to win. End of sentence. Yeah, so, I, I think that's the right thing to say in this situation, though. And it's the the thing I do like about like his his, what his tenure there has been. It's just like it's been really hard nosed, gritty, just gutsy performances. Like that's been like the program, like while he was there. And just you want those guys in that in that clubhouse that are just hard nosed, gritty. You know, tough outs. You know, tough abs. And that was I think the 
the high, the prime and just the, kind of the best thing of, I guess, the team and just like how the, the style of play was. That was probably my favorite thing. But I mean, looking at Kingston's record, 217 wins, 155 losses in the seven seasons, including 83 and 96 in SEC play. Losing record in SEC play. I mean, that kind Not of- Not the standard at South Carolina. No, that says it all. Guys, that's it. Again, we had five teams punch their tickets to the Super Regionals. Harrison and I later this week will break it all down, preview it, predict it, all that good stuff. Harrison, before we get out of here, uh, final takeaways from the weekend that was in college baseball, a wild regional weekend to say the least. Yeah, it is awesome. I mean, the game of college baseball is growing. It, it, it feels like it's growing every year and more people are watching. It's it's such a great game. It's so exciting. You have one, two, three, four, five SEC teams in Super Regionals. If that doesn't tell you that the SEC, let alone the College World Series, they won the last four, I believe, College World Series now. The SEC is the cream of the crop in college baseball. And it, it's 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 awesome. The game is growing so fast, Chris. And it's so much fun to watch. And if, if you didn't watch regional baseball this weekend, you missed out. You missed out. Go watch regional baseball. Go back and watch it. It was that awesome. Go watch Super Regional Baseball this weekend. You are going to love it. Yeah, it was incredible. And I, I would say this too, what's so fascinating, we got a bunch of teams, whether from the SEC or even not some of the others, uh, a lot of teams with an opportunity to punch their first ever tickets to Omaha. We got a couple teams in there able to, or opportunities to win their first ever national title. So the exciting thing, like well, you mentioned, the game is growing and it's new blood that we're getting in, in some of these, these shootings. It's a, it's a nice mix of tradition, but yeah. also – we got some of these new programs that are that are making headway and uh, contending for the ultimate prize. Chris, so, twelve really of the sixteen cool. super regional teams have never won a college world series this year. That's incredible. That's incredible. Maybe we will have a new champion, uh, guys. Appreciate you all tuning in. Thank you all so much. This has been electric. Again, make sure you like, subscribe, turn on notifications, check us out via podcast wherever you get podcasts. Of course, we're all across social media as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. And again, stay tuned. In just a couple of days. We'll be right back here previewing, breaking down, predicting the upcoming weekend. Super Regionals tickets to Omaha are on the line. For Harrison fans, I'm Chris Phillips. We appreciate you guys tuning in, and we'll catch you on the other side.